Jeff Buescher, Senior Advisor at SRD and Certified Wildlife Biologist, discusses how property owners can benefit from hunting leases as added revenue sources. We hope you enjoy. In our Expert Opinion podcast is brought to you by SVN Saunders Ralston Danzler Real Estate, a full service land and commercial brokerage with over $4 billion in transactions since 1996. Okay, welcome back to In Our Expert Opinion podcast. Uh, today we have a fun guest, Jeff so. Buescher. Not and a lot of people call me fun, but I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> I think you probably have a very fun job, and I think that you've had fun, like, previous jobs, too. I enjoy it. Yeah. I enjoy it. So you are a uh, broker here at Saunders. Yep, an agent with Saunders. Yeah. But I also run Legacy Wildlife Services. That's yes. That's primarily what I do. That's my full-time gig and and uh, fill in the blanks with, with Saunders. But but Legacy is a division of Natural Resource Planning Services, and you've had Jay and some of our other folks in here. NRPS is a consulting company that's been around for 50 years this year. 2024 is our 50th year. So Congratulations. That's, that's a big deal for us. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do a lot of things. They have a traditional forestry management division, you know, pine plantations. Uh, Jay runs the environmental services division. We have an arbor division. Obviously, we broker through, with Dean here, and I run the wildlife services division of that. And so what that means is we have a staff of five certified wildlife biologists, including myself, but, uh, and we're a full service wildlife consulting firm. So that means we can do anything relative to wildlife, but 95% of what we do is really hunting lease management. Yeah, and so how do you become a wildlife biologist? Schooling. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a bachelor's degree, a some cum laude degree in wildlife biology, and then uh, <clears throat> certification through the the Wildlife Society, uh, saying that you have the experience and education to be a biologist. So. What does that even mean? <laughs> <laughs> it used to mean that I did fun things. When I worked for the Pennsylvania Game Commission or Georgia DNR, I was a uh, an elk biologist in Pennsylvania, and I did white-tailed deer research and black bear research in Georgia. It was fun stuff. I, I trapped nuisance gators and duck banding and things. So I was in the woods, dirty every day, worked out of my truck. It was a lot of fun, long hours and, and fun in the woods. What were you researching, though? Like, what are you, I mean, I see an animal and I'm like, there it is. But, you know, what are you what are you researching? Sure. In, in Pennsylvania, it was an expansion of the elk range there. We were looking to expand that range out of its small territory. In Georgia, we were looking at some quality deer management standards. We were putting radio tracking collars on deer and following them around uh, a, as the state was developing some of its quality deer management regulations. And then we looked at a bear population in central Georgia, <clears throat> again, trapping bears and putting collars on them to see where they're moving to, really where that population existed and how big it was. So. Did you ever have any close calls? I had a bunch of, well, I mean, I trapped uh, 140 different black bears, you know, ranging in size from a 100-pound bear to a 460-pound bear. So they'd be on the end of a little snare, and I'd have a jab stick, and I'd have to uh, give them some juice and put them to sleep, and then we'd work them up. So it was very exciting. Even if these animals are asleep, I'm still not getting, get, no, no. And I've had this conversation on this podcast before, but like between an alligator and a shark, I'd rather fight a shark. But I don't know about a bear if you throw like bear, alligator, or shark. Bears weren't that mean, believe it or not. Really? Yep, the biggest bears that we caught, the four, three and 400 pound bears were pretty docile. The, the meanest thing I ever caught in a snare was a, a pig. Actually, I caught a feral hog one time in a bear snare by accident. There's not much of a, of a hand to catch a pig with, but, uh, but we caught one and it was the meanest, nastiest thing trying to eat me. My dad always said like, if you see like a pig, climb a tree and I'm like have you ever known or met me I have zero upper body You're not or zero low no I did get chased by a buffalo one time and I could have climbed a tree at that time because I, I had so much adrenaline going through me but um yeah I don't trust any type of wild animal I trust them it's people I don't trust <laughs> <laughs> yeah did you ever encounter any kind of like mountain people like mountain people <laughs> Appalachian. We, we all of our people are crazy people. That's <laughs> I call them my people. Our hunt club guys. They're they're interesting folks. You know they are in the woods guys. 
So my father would be one of them. Yeah. So I understand. They're, they're special well. people, but we appreciate them. That you know, that's that's our background certainly, and we're all hunters and sportsmen, and all in leases and hunting out there. So we can kind of relate to them, which I think is what makes us good at what we do. Yeah. So. And so you are running the um, hunt lease like division, that's or right. okay, yeah, it's the division of NRPS. Wh um, most of our listeners will know what a hunt lease is, but for those that don't, what are you talking about? Sure, sure. It's just a, an agreement. So if somebody has, say, a thousand acre piece of property and they're not utilizing and they want to allow folks to hunt on it, so they'll lease it out for hunting, lease it to an individual or a group of folks, have a little contract, and basically for an annual term, say that you can come out there from July through June each year and, and recreate and, uh, you know, hunt all the species that the state allows out on the property. So oh, okay. So it's 360, you know, five day access to the property. So it's sort of responsible recreation. It's a little more than hunting these days. We call it hunting leases and that's what folks think of it, but it's, uh, folks are out there on the property pretty much year round. I don't think I realized that you could hunt any animal. I thought maybe it was just well, anything legal in the state. <laughs> By state regulation. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I suppose if you kill a panther, you're over. Yes, you're done for. Trouble, yep. um, and leases can be written differently. You could have a deer only lease. Okay. That's that, right. That allows only allows you in there one month prior to season, and then okay. two weeks after season, and then a different turkey lease on the same property. Like it's possible. Okay. okay. Yep. Some but, some people do that. Ours we tend to have everything consolidated in in one lease and try and grab the value from that. And, and a lot of the value in leases comes from the exclusivity of a lease that even if if you lease it to some deer hunters who aren't necessarily going to turkey hunt, it, they sort of think of it as their property. They, they want the exclusive access to it and choose okay. not to hunt turkeys, okay. but rather than pile somebody else in there on top of them. Yeah. You start piling group in after group in and it begins to look a little more like public land and that's what they're paying to get away from. You know, oh. they're, they're paying yeah. for the exclusive access. Like a private a club. Bit better management. And a, that's right. Yeah. And so, um, you know, are these properties, I think I'd mentioned on the phone, like, I know some of these g people who will do like, feed, you know, they go out there and they like put feed out for food, these animals to draw plots. them in. Yeah. yeah. And is, are you guys responsible for that? Or is the lessee or, you know, how does this work in order to have a property that someone would want to lease out? That's right. Yep. I mean, most folks, if they've got some sort of timbered property or a, a ranch even agricultural property someone would love to lease it you know if, if it's got deer or turkey or hogs or you know ducks the folks would love to get out there and those folks are hunt clubs that we put out there they do all the work it's very hands-off for okay. a landowner or ourselves even we're not out there planting food plots and filling feeders but the hunt club is you know they're extra eyes on the property for you because they are out there year-round feeding deer, putting in feeders, running cameras, you know, planting food plots. A lot of them will have a little camp right there on the property where they can sort of get away on a weekend, you know, in the middle of summer and just camp out. I've seen those camps. I'm not. <laughs> they, they are shanty towns. I'm not a sure, camper. No, no, I'm not a camper. That's one of the services we provide <laughs> landowners is to, to make sure those camps stay semi, uh, semi, <laughs> semi-permanent. Uh, Linda is currently watching me uh, redo a fifth wheel camper on my Snapchat stories. So she's seeing how rough these things can be. Yep. I know when we talked on the phone, I was like, are you gonna sleep in that? Like, what are you doing? But my dad had taken me camping one time. It was horrific. Like I should have sued him, no <laughs> doubt. And after that, I was like, you'll never catch me out here again. And indeed, I never, I never went back. They stay in some rough structures. Then they're supposed to be temporary structures. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. Oh, they're definitely, oh, they'll blow away. Yes. They're te they are temporary structures. We've seen some two story temporary structures <laughs> though. Yeah. And some mobile homes show up, you know, that's one of the things we've got to watch for the landowner. We sort of keep okay. an eye on the place because it can look like two campers in a very nice consolidated camp and you come back six months later and there might be a mobile home in there we have had that happen on occasions where they moved in a sure enough <laughs> residence and it's not intended for that they don't want that there's some yeah. implications for that oh yeah um that's a little bit of adverse possession which i think we talked about with one of our attorneys that came on here um but it adds a lot of value for them to be able to bring, yes. bring an rv out there and spend the weekend yeah and so um 
you know, I, these leases sound very self-sufficient. It sounds like, you know, it's a really good opportunity for the landowner, especially, you know, if you have like an out-of-state landowner that doesn't necessarily come down, but maybe once a year, if that. Um, and so, you know, you guys are kind of like boots on the ground, making sure that everything is okay it and is. that people so aren't putting mobile homes on, that's right you know large landowners absentee landowners institutional kind of ownership that that's our target client okay for sure somebody that we can help them manage that property and it's very passive income for them they just allow these folks out there and then we monitor them to check for compliance but, yeah. Uh, yeah and um i mean how do you monitor do you do you go out to the properties or we you know we have those four full-time biologists that are just out there in the woods riding and checking and looking for liability issues and compliance with the lease and okay. dealing with the hunt clubs if the hunt club has an issue they'll meet with them out there and look at a road issue maybe or or some access issue that they're dealing with or a bad neighbor dispute you know so they are all the time keeping us in the woods meeting it, with the clubs and uh you know i mean are you guys keeping track of the animals that they're you know, killing on these. We do collect harvest okay. data. Yeah, we okay. ask each of the clubs to provide us harvest data and let us know, you know, so that we could sort of verify that they're managing. You know, we <clears throat> we have some quality deer managed clubs, yeah. but we are at a minimum, we require them to hunt by state regulation. Yeah. Most of these guys hunt above and beyond that much better management. And we assist them with that as biologists, but we don't require it. You know, we need okay. all the hunters we can get in the woods. So we use quality deer management guys that are just shooting big mature bucks and dog hunters, you know, and, and still hunters and hog hunters and bow hunters and turkey hunters, we need every hunter we can get in the woods. So we what, don't discriminate. Why do you say that? Because, you know, I feel like I see on Instagram or social media and people are like the, talking about populations dwindling or, you know, they're getting upset that um, maybe somebody's harvesting a certain species of animal. So it's like, you know, I, I see in the media that it's doesn't necessarily have a good it has a negative connotation so sometimes yeah yeah you know the state regulations are always evolving and changing and that's one of our jobs is to keep our clubs informed of those state regulations to make sure that they evolve and change with them they have changed a lot in the 18 years 20 years that i've been doing this is and it's a process you know with managing in seven states our guys have a lot to keep up with to understand those regulations and make sure yeah. we're compliant and not abusing the resource you know we want for our landowner clients, we want them to, have, to generate revenue, but we don't want to abuse their resource either. So we want good clubs. We're a lot more hands-on than, than some folks would be. They sign a document with the club, go out there, we'll see you next year when that payment's due. But yeah. we have a lot of interaction with them. Most of, uh, most of our clubs have our guys' cell phones. You know, they're ringing them at Friday night at 8 o'clock to ask questions. So it, it can be. So that that's seven states, and you said a million acres no, that's correct? right yep it's seven states that we manage in a million acres which is something like just over 1600 individual hunt clubs we deal with the you know a leaseholder an individual and it's tens of thousands of members that are yeah. out there yeah so it's a lot of folks on the property we maintain membership lists and we give them all id cards so it's a it's a full-time deal for us to to be able to keep up with that administration and the management on the ground and i think that's what makes us different a lot of folks do leases sort of as a byproduct of timber management or a byproduct of their ranch manager just just does it as something that he does in his 50 hour week. But we do this full time, you know, we're on it, like I said, 95% of what we do is, is lease management. And I think that makes the difference. You know, we do give these guys our cell phones. We are looking at it, working on it every day, trying to figure out markets for landowners so that they're getting top dollar revenue. Those markets are always evolving and changing. So there's a, a lot to it, a lot more than Hunting leases sound simple and, and are generally relatively simple, but there's almost a proprietary way that we do it with our knowledge base that helps us to to really make it an effective and efficient and profitable system for hunting lease management. Yeah, so you guys are keeping track of the um, like lease amounts that you know property owners are charging um, depending on like where they're at. That's right. Okay. Yep. Lease rates are very uh, very local. 
Uh, oh, I can imagine. Uh, yes. Yeah, and not I can, unlike real estate. You know, there's very different markets in different parts of states and across the southeast. It varies tremendously. Where we sit right now, most of these markets are like $20 an acre or more is what you'd have to think about if you were going to lease something. Of course, we work in Arkansas, too, and th those markets are like $8 an acre. So, so very different, just yeah. based on a lot of different dynamics. Not necessarily based on the quality of the deer, because Arkansas has tremendously better deer than you might find in Central Florida. Uh, but there's 22 million people here in Florida, and that drives a tremendous demand. Yeah. So really, it's demand that pushes the rates in Florida versus the quality of the hunting. It has to be. Now, do you have any type of like, I mean, I, I, I don't think that you can do like qual quality control. I, can you? Like with the animals or anything? It's like, what if these lessees are like, these are some of the worst animals I've ever seen in my life. Some, like Some we do. We certainly have some places that we do quality deer management cooperatives. Some landowners want that, some don't. And we have big clubs, 30,000 acre blocks here and there where clubs work together to, to manage for quality and you know, be a, have a very selective harvest. They're pulling jaw bones to bring to us to age. They're taking weights and measurements, you know, then we're evaluating what's coming off of that property and giving okay. them sort of a plan. It looks good. Here's what you need to do to make it better and move forward into the future. So we can get very hands on with it in certain scenarios. That's not appropriate for the entire million acre footprint, though. So, yeah, that's incredible, though, that you can tell by a bone that yeah, tooth wear and replacement it generally works. So I don't even no, I don't know no what that why. means. Yeah. Um, so if you if you looked at my teeth right now versus somebody who's 50 years old, like there'd be a difference in wear. Same in animals. That's right. Hmm. And there's a pattern in deer's lower jawbone that you can tell generally wear and replacement for the first few years. And of course, deer you know, generally don't live much beyond five or six years old, especially Is that right? in the high, highly hunted. Yeah, areas, well. So. <laughs> and, that, and that's important because you want the sportsmen on the property to be taking the, the ones who may die next year anyways because of old age or okay. yeah yeah so their their rack is is done growing it's probably going to start declining because their nutrition is going to decline and they, when do they think that they shed their antlers every year they do well well they grow start growing in april here shortly and okay grow through you know shed velvet in august and then drop again in february and okay. start the process all over again so what a yeah. full-time job for those guys out there. <laughs> Come to my office. I've got a stack of shit antlers about that tall. You can pick through. I mean, almost here, too, for goodness <laughs> right. sake. I saw we had yeah, some kind I'm of a, a little version of Dean. I don't have quite the caliber of what he's got here. but I... um, We do have some very unique animals in our office. So you do quality control. That's right. Do you do quantity control as well for sure and the state does that they set pretty strict limits and that that harvest data that we get we're able to look at that and make sure that they're compliant to the best of our ability you know they're they're out there by themselves we can't be everywhere all at once yeah but uh, but we do our best to, to keep after folks and make sure that, and it's only to their advantage that they manage it correctly that these leases are done annually but you know they're going to sort of automatically renew these with these folks they'll get first right of refusal and they want them most of our leaseholders are long term some of them have been on these properties for 20 30 plus years okay so it's to their advantage not to shoot it out you know to sort yeah. of manage it in a little better way so that every year it gets a little better and there's always something for for yeah next year. so that they're actually getting something for their money you know instead okay. of just going buck wild if you will um okay so then how i mean in our line of work, real estate, mm -hmm. I would think that that would be a lucrative uh, position to find yourself in if you have one of these leases on your property because it it is a revenue For sure. generator. Um, you know, but how does that? Are you using that to advertise properties, or um, is that something that buyers are looking for? It's factored in certainly on large investment type properties yeah you know they want to know what is the revenue being generated from your timber or from your pasture leases or from your agriculture and from your hunting leases you know any anything that can be out there you know leases we like I said we've been doing this the company has been doing this for 40 years when leases used to be a dollar an acre and now they're more like 20 dollars an acre so they, they can be significant now. yeah 
Yeah, and they can fall behind very quickly too. That's the other thing we do for the landowners is okay. keep them in line with the markets that are ever changing and evolving. You know, I, I did this through the dips in 2008 and, and we've been climbing up and up ever since then. And they've been sort of exploding in recent years. And if you're just a landowner that's not paying much attention, you could be ending up getting 50% of the revenue you ought to be receiving for these leases. So. Yeah, well, I can imagine, especially in Florida, that um, the rates have gone, just keep going up basically. They have, yeah, they've been skyrocketing in recent years. Lots of demand and those rates have just been going up and up. We, we get our, our marketing data from two different sources. We have a sister company that's an appraisal firm and they provide us with a, appraisal data on leases for millions of acres across the Southeast. So it's very helpful for us to know. But of course, managing a million acres, we also have a lot of contact points out there every day. All my guys are constantly collecting data, ground truthing data from neighbors that we might interact with or clubs that might lease our property and then another timber company's property. And you know, we're always picking for that data and, and keeping track of that information. So we have those two sources, which is proved to be a pretty reliable uh, method to collect data and understand and be, be relevant and where we need to be in the markets. Now, do you have um, property owners that do not have, that have not had leases on their properties and they're, you know, trying to see if their land would be eligible or like, you know, a good candidate for these leases and how do you determine you know, yeah, you should definitely get into leasing out your, your property. I will say that most of the folks we deal with do have some sort of leasing program in place, whether they're leasing to a buddy or a family member or something, they've got something in place. And, and there we come in and help them to be more efficient and effective and profitable. There are landowners that don't lease stuff. We deal with some folks that have not leased in the past, looking to lease going forward, and we come in and help them set up that system, how, how that will work, how that would be most marketable, evaluate the property and tell them, we think you ought to divide it this way and have this okay. many leases and, and offer it out sort of in this kind of package. You know? And you know, almost any property, if, if it's timberland, you know, if it's ranch wreck, if it's agricultural, if it's got some wildlife on it, it's probably well suited for a hunting lease. You know, that's something they could be putting on top of that uh, and just getting, you know, another source of passive income that they might not be be collecting right now. Now, if they don't have, you know, the animals that people are looking for in order to, to get into these leases, are you advising these property owners, like, maybe you should do this to uh, kind of draw in whatever There's type of animal? they could yeah. do to enhance the habitat, for sure. Yeah. Know, that would make it a little better yeah. you know, for deer and turkey and wildlife and game species. But a lot of Florida, you know, it's just good, good habitat to begin with. Yeah. There's not much that doesn't have some sort of, sort of wild game population on it right now. Do you get into any sort of gator hunting? Yeah. 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 We, do that. yeah for yeah. Sure. we can get, you know, Florida has some programs where you can get landowner tags for a big enough piece of property where you can apply for yep. tags to hunt some public areas. We've done it. I've got a seven foot gator on my wall. Dean's got one that's a little bit bigger than that, I think, downstairs. But uh. yeah, that was uh, that was uh, thanks to Ethan Falk, who was an advisor here, and he got that one. And now it's downstairs. That one's special. That's a dinosaur. Mine's, <laughs> mine looks more like a traditional gator. So. I know. Still terrifying either way. Um, but even, you know, in Lakeland, I'll walk these lakes and there's just like gators everywhere. And I'm. I'm thinking like, I don't remember seeing that many as a kid growing up on the St. John's. Um, They've definitely expanded. Their, oh my their, gosh, right? The state keeps issuing more and more tags. Do they? To that. Yeah. It's a lot of fun to gator hunt. I mean, it is. It's something that's a pretty unique opportunity that we have here in Florida. Oh, for sure. That, that a lot of folks would love to do and take advantage of. For sure. You know, some people come from out of state to be able to do that. You know, hunt Osceola turkeys or gators and we're the place you can come do it. So. Oh my God. What is it with these different types of every like male friend that I have, it's like, Osceola turkey. I'm like, what? What, what is it? What just, is it? Just different subspecies of, of of wild turkey. Do they look better? Uh, we we think they do. <laughs> In Florida, of course, we're biased. We think our Osceolas are the pretty ones. But you know, the Eastern and Miriam and Rio. And so there's there's a grand slam. You, you know, the real turkey hunter wants each of the subspecies and okay. travel around the country to try and do that. And if they want an Osceola, they have to come here to Florida. And finding a place to go you know, is going okay. to be expensive. They're going to really, yeah. 
a lot of our leases have that. But, you know, someone coming from out of state doesn't want to get into a lease. They, they want yeah. sort of a guided scenario where they'll come for a weekend. And yeah. Night, so. Which is very different than, than a very a power passive leases. You know, they're annual leases. There's no guiding going on. It's just. Yeah, you're on your own for you to figure out where, where the best setup is going to be. That's right. Yeah. Um, I've never understood it, and that's totally fine. But yeah, you know, I have these friends who are like all about it, and I'm just thinking. Hunt, hunting is a very cultural thing, and and we're we're very appreciative. I'm very appreciative of that. You know, people there's people do a lot of things for recreation. You can golf, you know, ride horses, all kinds of stuff. But hunting is is cultural. Folks folks are bound to that. They want to do that. They're going to find ways to, I've seen folks pawn the title to their truck to pay for their leases. You know, they are, I've seen them skip mortgage payments to, to pay their lease fees. You can, there's a bank in Perry, Florida, where you can get a loan for your lease fees because folks want to hunt. You know, when, when things get tough, so you might give up golfing, you know, you might not ride your horse as much, or you might get rid of your horses, but folks are going to hunt. And, and that is what really leads to the development. They're willing to pay, they want to hunt, they're going to do it, and they're willing to pay to do that. And we're very thankful for them. A lot of other yeah. folks are not, bird watchers are not. We've, try, we've tried to, to double dip, per se, put horseback riding and bird watchers and photographers on top of our hunting leases. And it just, don't wor it just does not work because those folks aren't willing to pay. There's no value in the exclusivity. Yeah. We had a group of horseback riders that wanted to come ride on us one time. We said, we'd love to, to lease this property to you. You could ride $10 an acre. And they seemed offended that we were asking for money to for them to come use this property for the exclusive use of this property. And it's because the exclusive use means nothing to a horseback rider. Okay. They can hit the national forest and there can be a hundred other people riding horses. And it just doesn't matter. They're all just having a good time and riding. But but to hunters, there's some real value in the exclusivity, and they're willing to pay for it. You know, they they pay to support that resource, and and that what that's what builds this whole hunting lease dynamic that we've built a company on. So. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, but you know, you had mentioned like 2008 um, recession and everything, and um, from the sounds of it, not that hunt leases are recession proof. But it sounds like even during like really troubled times that um, these lessees are still willing to pay. That's right. You know, these owners. Yeah. Um, Markets and rates weren't booming at that time. The rates didn't move. Yeah. From 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. There was a, a slow response, but we still st stayed 99% lease during that time. Folks were going to hunt. Folks found that money even in very in very bad economies to to pay for those leases and, and continue to get out there that is true commitment it, it is good yeah. grief and we're, th we're thankful yeah. for it. yeah i'm sure the property owners are as well and i'm a hunter i'm that way too i need somewhere to go i am going to hunt every year <laughs> Uh, you know, I have to have a place to go, and I'm just like these folks. We've had several different leases, some that have been sold, and you get moved around. It's just part of it. So we've had uh, three different lease properties in five different years just due to sales and tran transition. Yeah. Leases are a little bit vulnerable to yeah. that. You don't own it, so, you know, it could be sold or developed or shifted or something. But are you seeing a lot more sales with these leases? In Florida, we have been yeah. a lot of higher, better use development and losing some leasing ground in Florida, which just increases the demand because when we lose it and it becomes rooftops in Florida, you know, those yeah. folks want to go somewhere. They're going else elsewhere, into Georgia, into the Carolinas, into Alabama, wherever they can still find some good property yeah yeah that is i mean who said men don't commit they i mean they they are committing to these who places did, who we did will, say that i don't know who, who did, who, we will definitely who, commit. Yeah. i don't know um are are a lot of these uh landowners whenever they do decide to sell and they've got a hunt lease through you and legacy are they using you and using saunders as a as a brokerage and outlet to occasionally we do there is some synergy there we have done some deals that way as as a, as it relates to hunting lease management a lot of times we don't a lot of times they're monstrous packages you know we deal with landowners that are buying 30 and 40,000 acres in Alabama and Arkansas and I'm certainly not licensed to do anything in those states so but there is some synergy there you know that's kind of my focus in real estate obviously is I do yeah. recreational real estate so I've sold some high fences and some small recreational tracks where folks are have a little lodge and develop on the river or something where they can fish and hunt and 
Yeah, there's some value to that, but that that is very expensive to do. You know, a twenty dollar an acre lease sounds very expensive until you think about eight thousand dollar an acre property here in Florida to try and buy a hundred acres to hunt on. So yeah, yeah, they're a, they're really a bargain if you think about it. I want to get into this high fence real quick. <laughs> okay. Um, it's not a lot of what we do, but I, I have. Seems a point of contention, that. maybe with different groups of like hunters. You know, I think sometimes they think it's like cheating, right? Or like maybe they're like, oh, that's like shooting fish in a barrel. That's right. But it's my understanding that it's not. It certainly depends on your perspective. You know, some some landowners and they have these high fences a lot of times to cultivate really big deer. You know, it keeps, yeah. keeps you from losing your big deer and you're able to have a breeding program. It's a whole different scenario. Yeah. It's almost animal. Which would go hus into husbandry. quantity. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And we do a little bit with high fences. Most yeah. of our stuff is, is open range. Okay. Range. Okay. You know, just timberland property, ranch property. That's not under high fence. But but we have dealt with some. And, you know, it it's a very uh, unique and specific part of the market you know there's there's big money in in breeding deer and having those high fences is and some high fences are monstrous some are, are five and ten thousand acre high fences texas has a bunch of big high fences you know that you wouldn't even know you're in a fence right and, and that you know right. is is a much different scenario than having a hundred acre pen where you can kind of see the the pen the entire way around so i went to a high fence ranch um it might have been in sebring and it was stunning, but they had the they had these incredible animals that I had never even seen. But what was really wild to me was that they left that front gate open, but they had the cattle. Oh, the cattle gap. Yeah. There, so they couldn't get out. I was like, How, why aren't they leaving? And the woman was like, because they would break their legs over that thing. I'm like, right. oh, okay, that makes more sense. But it was an incredible. But they were more into like. Um, uh, genetics you know they, they weren't hunting anything there but they were more into right. genetics and that's typically what a lot of those high fences are breeding programs and, and some of the controversy surrounded by that these days is disease that comes with moving deer from one high fence to the other okay chronic wasting disease is the big big one that's spreading throughout the southeast right now God, that's... like we just detected in florida the game uh, the game commission just found it uh, out there in the panhandle in holmes county so what is it yeah, it's a it's a misfolded protein. It's a disease, a neurological disease that deer get, and once it starts, it's very difficult to control. And they tend to believe that a lot of that is some of that anyway comes from deer being moved between high fence to high fence. So there's been a lot of regulations recently that you can't transport deer out of state and okay. in state. It all has to be internal. Okay. Well, I mean, is there uh, anything else you want to add or? Anything that we didn't mention? Yeah, we, we covered it pretty well. It's just, you know, legacy wildlife is, we've been uh, developed sort of over 30 or 40 years uh, yeah. over NRPS managing leases through through their foresters and, and realizing in the late 90s that, uh, that there might be something there. There's something to these leases. We might be able to maximize these if we put some folks to focus. Yeah. On. So they hired a, a game warden here to started this program for us. Guy Gator Banks, a famous game warden. There's a book about him. Look him up. Oh, my gosh. We're proud to have him on staff. He's kind of the paterfamilias of our uh, of our program. But he he came on board and focused on it and developed. And he was an, a full-time game warden at the time, worked part-time for us, and then came to work full-time for us all through the late 90s and sort of developed the program. And it, it did very well under him. You know, as a wildlife professional focusing on these things. In fact, he did so well that it was too much administration for him. And he said, I want to just be in the woods. So he, he was my boss and he hired me to be his boss, which was a strange scenario. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I came on board to help him with some of the admin way back in 2006 and continued to do that, continued yeah. to just be wildlife biologist focused on hunting leases for, for our landowner clients, but also as a customer service thing to our, our hunt club customers. It sounds like a lot of customer service, especially yes. if you have tens of thousands of, of these club members That's right. possibly calling you at, you know. Possibly. We try to deal just with the 1,600 acre, uh, 1,600 leaseholders, yeah. you know, the primary contacts. Yeah. But we do occasionally get, get pulled down into the weeds a little bit. Any crazy stories? Oh, there's, there's lots of crazy stories. <laughs> <laughs> any uh stumbled upon any dead bodies or anything uh no luckily. okay no 
we've been fortunate because we we have put ourselves in some scenarios where we could come across some strange stuff but but typically the worst of it is being stuck in the woods somewhere okay. in remote arkansas or something but okay uh, yeah no no shootouts or anything no i've been shot at once or, mm -mm. Once or twice yeah the, on, they per, on they purpose well they didn't know it was me they were just shooting at whoever whatever trespasser <laughs> they thought i was it just happened to, to be their lease manager so uh it did not work out well for his long-term usage of the property, but uh, typically, yeah, you should probably lay eyes on yeah. you know what you're like shooting at. Um, yeah. He was just shooting at my truck though, so it, it was okay. Don't. That's almost worse. Don't mess with my car, man. Like, do not mess with my I've car. I've seen your truck. <laughs> it's a nice truck. <laughs> that is insane yeah. so upsetting yeah we had, had a lot of trespass issues and yeah I, I was it was late and i tried to we, you know we spent a lot of time out in the woods yeah and we try not to do it during prime times when i think they'll be hunting and if i pull up and i see somebody's parked there i tend to back out and not try to interrupt their hunts and this was when i had pulled in it was late it was 4 30 it was getting late on a, on a friday evening and i pulled in to look at one last area and uh and up to a food plot and all of a sudden there were some shots headed in my direction there weren't any vehicles you know but he was out there in a box stand oh he was waiting yeah he, he was hunting and he, he was waiting. I was just some neighbor or some trespasser riding in to check you know to maybe shoot a deer off of his food plot also i'm like do you want to chill because it's this is not a life or death situation. it became a life or death situation but this didn't have to be a life or death situation that's right okay so we just eased back out of there and, and left him a note and waited for him to come out and uh, had a little come to Jesus meeting with him, got him all straight. And, uh, but that's what we do for landowners. You know, we just help them out because that's what you don't want. You don't want your landowner clients to be riding in and having these guys. And have a murder on their hands. Right. Uh, yeah. Costing them and saying who they are. They certainly, you know, are added security to the property. We want them to say, hey, who are you? You know, what are you doing out here? I, I have the lease on this. But we don't want them being crazy and shooting at folks and cussing folks out. So. Yeah, no, there's. And leases can do that. They get very passionate about it. They get very invested in the property. They get almost an own ownership mentality of the which is why a lot of people don't like to deal with them you know because they think they're, yeah. they're a pain but being higher firm like legacy wildlife and you know we'll manage that that problem for you and try to keep it under control and yeah and you then, guys are the bait so that's right you know yeah. they'll send you in first and then they'll come in afterwards <laughs> absolutely that is awful and which, hilarious would you say that the leaseholders generally leave the property in as good if not better shape than what they found it generally yes definitely most folks do you know and we work with them if they don't we're paying attention to okay. make sure that they're not doing things they shouldn't be doing on the property hurting the property and and get them to clean it up you know we have some they want that lease they want to stay there so we have some pretty good power over them with a good lease document and proper insurance you know all part of the administration that we have to do we have some pretty good control over them to be able to say Look, guys, we need to fix this. We need to do that. You need to do this better. Do this in a different way, or you're not going to get your lease back. And nobody wants that. You know, yeah. they want to keep their lease. So. Well, because I can imagine that there's somebody in line waiting to get that. There, there lease. is. Yes, we get a thousand calls a, a year. Wow. Of folks looking for leases, and in the last few years, I've had very little turnover. You know, very okay. very little available properties to be able to offer out to the public. So. Yeah. Well, I'd imagine if you know, there's a lot of property transitioning from agriculture into you know development then yeah there's even less you know that's right those are guys that have lost their lease through no fault of their own yeah looking to go somewhere else. yeah you know and very difficult to find it you likely to have to drive hours to to find some some property yeah so if you're lucky enough to lease in your backyard pay whatever they're asking because it's hard to come by <laughs> I would if I could find one in my backyard. I mean, you'd think I would have the best lease in the right, southeast, but, right? But I do not. No, but you know what? Do they ever invite you to like hunt on their property? I get lots of invites. Okay. I try not to go though. Oh, really? Yeah, it creates a conflict. Okay. I don't put myself in that situation. Okay. Yeah. 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 Lots of invites. Yeah. So. Well, whenever you retire, you just keep those in mind. Absolutely. And then you can be busy all the time. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Well, we so appreciate you driving all the way. Uh, how many hours? Yep, it's three hours from our main, our corporate headquarters in Lake City, and that's about three hours north of you. Yep. But we consider this our backyard. If I'm going to Arkansas or the Carolinas, this is just a short little jaunt for the day. So yeah, this is nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Uh, you could be like um, Mike Dan Boys and get a helicopter. Yeah, I'm working on that. Yeah. yeah. I'm seeing if Jack Vogel will buy me a helicopter. Well, 
get on Dean too, because I've been like, can we get a golf cart around here, please? Yeah. I want to go to Publix like and not walk. Trouble. If he won't get you a golf cart, he is not getting you a helicopter. I know. Well, we have a I'll work side. on it. Yeah, I'll work on it. You know, I'll use my. Keep asking. Yeah. Yeah. I'll work. I'll just. All he can say is no. Linda, maybe, <laughs> he does. Maybe Dean will hire you to be his boss, like Jeff. When got you to said that, I I had this thought in my mind about how do I start working on that? Yeah. I was working for him, Plans but soon he'll be working for me. Right here. I know you did give me that. I, I really, right now. I really did think about that. I thought that is such a good goal and everybody's going to pay. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Anyways, Jeff, thank you so much for coming on. We hope that you'll come back. This has been truly enlightening. I hope so. Um, too boring. No. I, I could talk for eight hours about hunting leases, but uh, I it's kind of my thing. could not, but I would listen. <laughs> <laughs> I could listen. How do people find you? Uh, LegacyWildlife.com. All of our stuff is there through LegacyWildlife.com. Perfect. Yep. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Jeff. It's been a pleasure. And uh, I guess start wearing like those yellow orange vests out there so people can see. Definitely wear your orange. You know, <laughs> take a bullhorn with you. It's me, you know, so. We won't shoot you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for listening. Thank you.